Just 11 years after the Wright brothers took flight in a powered aircraft for the first time, primitive aircraft were being taken to the front lines as Europe exploded into the Great War in August 1914. But aside from reconnaissance, the military leaders of the day barely factored them into their plans. However, within just four years, those primitive aircraft had evolved to becoming heavily armed and able to rain bombs and machine gun fire from above. Control of the skies over the battlefield went from being something of an afterthought to being one of the highest priorities, and for that, there needed to be a force of aircraft that could be sent up to destroy the enemy's machines and deny them the advantages the aircraft offered. Originally called flying scouts, these planes were now known as fighters. And when the next war came, the pilots of fighters would at times hold the fate of their own nation in their hands. In today's episode of Wars of the World, we're looking at the deadliest and most notable fighter pilots of World War II. Vladislav Ganish was a fighter pilot who, on the morning of September 1st, 1939, heard the scream of the alarm, sending him and his Polish Air Force compatriots out to their mounts, the PZL P-11C fighter plane. Modern by the standards of the Polish Air Force, it was still no match for the invading Germans fielding the excellent BF-109 Messerschmitt fighter, but the Polish pilots nevertheless pressed on with courage and tenacity. Ganesh took off along with Captain Medvecki, the group commander, sometime between 6 and 7 a.m. from his airfield to intercept German Dornier bombers that were attacking Krakow. Having barely reached 1,000 feet, the two Polish fighters suddenly found themselves being pounced upon by two German Stukas. Although a dive bomber, the Stuka was a capable opponent for the Polish planes, and in the exchange of gunfire that followed, a Stuka hit Captain Medvecki's plane. It careered down to the ground, killing the unfortunate Polish pilot in what is considered to be the first air combat casualty of World War II. Ganesh engaged with the Stukas and reported hitting one of them, causing smoke to begin coming out of the German's engine, but the Stukas made it back to their base safely. Ganesh then went on to intercept two of the German bombers, making several attacks on the two bombers with his 7.62mm machine guns, both Dorniers eventually crashed near the village of Zrada. As a result of this victory, Ganesh is often credited with the first Allied air victory of the war. Ganesh would continue to fight for his country until it fell on October 6th, but he himself would escape to continue the fight with both the French, then the British. As Ganesh and his countrymen fought against overwhelming odds, in Western Europe, things were a little quieter in the very early days, despite the declaration of war. But while Britain and France were gearing up, smaller European countries such as Holland, Norway, and Belgium joined a chorus of voices declaring their neutrality in the fighting. But that meant protecting that neutrality from both sides. They couldn't appear to favor either side in the fighting in any way, in case they invited attack from the other. And so, when a flight of bombers were detected penetrating Belgian airspace on the morning of September 9th, 1939, and were identified as being British, the Belgians had to respond the same way as though they were German. For Britain's RAF Bomber Command, the war had begun with their aircraft dropping leaflets instead of bombs on Germany, in an effort to discourage the Germans from continuing the war. That morning, the RAF Whitley bombers returning from one such mission over the Ruhr Valley had unintentionally strayed into Belgium. At Nivelles Air Base, Belgian Air Force Captain Lucien Bossa and two other members of his flight regiment took off in their British-built Fairy Fox and Firefly fighters. The trio intercepted one of the Whitleys, and Bossa fired a burst in front of the British bomber's nose, signaling its pilot to land. However, upon seeing Busa's machine guns opening up, the Whitley's tail gunner targeted and fired on one of the Belgian fireflies. The plane was hit and forced to land quickly. 
Another fairy fox had intercepted the second Whitley and signalled for it to land using radio and signal lights. The British bomber refused, and so they fired a warning shot, resulting once again in the British gunners opening up with their machine guns on the Belgians. Both planes were damaged, the Belgian pilots bailed out and their plane crashed, while the British bomber would eventually crash land in France. More pilots from Bowser's unit were now climbing into their planes, including Alex Jotard and Jean Offenberg, who pulled on their flying suits over their pajamas before taking off in their fireflies. They spotted the other Whitley and exchanged more warnings before the British bombers were forced to put down at Neville, where the crew were interned for several days before returning to Britain. Yet, despite this powerful declaration by the Belgians of their seriousness about remaining neutral, it failed to protect them. On May 10th, 1940, Germany invaded in an effort to bypass the main French defensive line. In just over two weeks, the country fell. By June 25th, France, Holland, and Norway had all fallen, leaving Britain alone to face a Nazi Germany dominating the map of Europe. In the following Battle of Britain, British fighter pilots, along with those from the Commonwealth, survivors of the countries that had fallen to Germany and American volunteers, faced off against the German Luftwaffe in an attempt to keep Hitler's forces from crossing the English Channel. It was a desperate fight, but a successful one. However, the war was far from over. Now, as Britain became a fortress, the German responded with an age-old tactic, the siege. Germany's U-boats flooded into the North Atlantic to sink cargo ships, bringing much needed food and war supplies to the beleaguered nation. At first, it might seem a little odd that fighter pilots would be used in combating submarines, but British fighter pilots had a key role in defeating the U-boats. In order to be effective in strangling Britain, first the U-boats had to locate the British ships, and for that, they needed help from the Luftwaffe. The Fokker Wolf FW200 was developed from an advanced airliner design, one of which Hitler had adopted as his personal transport and had a range in excess of 2,000 miles. With bases in occupied France, these aircraft could now roam far out to sea, beyond the range of British land-based fighters, and locate the convoys. The Fokker Wolf could then use its radio to vector in a U-boat wolf pack to devastating effect. The answer to this, of course, was for the Royal Navy's aircraft carrier fleet to escort the convoys, but in the early days of the war, there simply weren't enough of them to cover every convoy, and those precious resources they did have were heavily engaged in fighting the Italians in the Mediterranean. Something drastic had to be done. The result was the CAM ship. CAM, C-A-M, stands for Catapult Assisted Merchantman and was a cargo ship fitted with a platform on top, upon which was a Hawker Hurricane, or a fairy fighter. When a Fokker Wolf Condor was sighted, a rocket would catapult the fighter off the ship to attack it, but it was an extraordinarily dangerous mission, for there was no way to recover the fighter. If the convoy was close enough to shore, then the fighter pilot could try to fly to an airfield and land, but otherwise, his only option was to ditch near one of the convoy's escort ships, and hope to be picked up before freezing to death in the icy cold North Atlantic. It was a desperate solution for a desperate time. On August 3rd, 1941, cam ship HMS Maplin was sailing with the convoy OG-17 when a Condor was sighted, sending Royal Navy Volunteer Reserve Pilot Lieutenant Robert H. Everett scrambling to his Hawker Hurricane. Everett, a prestigious jockey before the war, having even won the Grand National, was fired off the deck of Maplin in pursuit of the Condor. He was especially eager to engage the plane, since during a previous convoy crossing, he was catapulted in pursuit of another Condor, but before he could engage, the plane was shot down by defensive gunners on the merchant ship, robbing him of combat. Fortunately, on that occasion, he was able to fly back to the UK, rather than ditch his plane. Just nine minutes after launching, his hurricane was within 600 yards of the German plane, whose gunners were now firing on him as he attempted to line up his own guns for a shot. After taking evasive action to avoid the German gunners, he pointed the nose of his fighter towards the Condor and fired off three five-second bursts, which raked the German plane's fuselage. Now out of ammunition, 
Everett noticed large pieces falling off the plane before it went down into the sea. This is particularly notable, because not only was Everett's kill the first victory by a cam fighter, it was also technically the first victory by a rocket fighter plane. After the fight, Everett lacked the fuel to reach land, and so began searching for an allied ship, finding the HMS Wanderer, which was escorting the nearby convoy SL-81. Everett ditched in its path and was scooped up by the destroyer. In total, between August 31st, 1941 and July 28th, 1943, CAM fighters would account for nine German planes destroyed. Despite the danger involved, only one pilot was ever killed during CAM operations. In the final years of the war, the CAM ships were no longer necessary, thanks to the introduction of small escort carriers that could launch and recover several fighters and bombers to defend against both German planes and U-boats. Still, there can be no doubt that men like Everett were extraordinarily brave. But this should not diminish the courage of all flyers in World War II. While their planes were far safer than the planes of World War I, they were also far more efficient and deadly in combat. The German Luftwaffe's vaunted BF-109 fighter lost 23% of their number in September 1940 during the height of the Battle of Britain. But for those who survived and would go on to perfect the science of air combat, those men would join the ranks of the aces. While the exact number has fluctuated from time to time, generally it is agreed that a fighter pilot must take down five enemy planes to be afforded the accolade of ace, and with units eventually fighting on three fronts in World War II, no other air force could come close to producing as many aces as the Luftwaffe. With an excellent training program based on a wealth of combat experience, coupled with gifted leaders and equipped with the excellent BF-109 and Fokker Wolf FW-190 fighters, the Luftwaffe was truly a terrifying force. Often facing overwhelming numbers of enemy aircraft, the Luftwaffe were able to hold their own thanks to their quality against the Allies' quantity and nowhere was this scene clearer than on the Eastern Front in the fight against the Soviet Union. Due to the sheer number of Soviet aircraft, it was not uncommon for Luftwaffe pilots to become aces in a single day, but one pilot would forge himself a legendary status in the annals of air combats in this brutal and bloody arena. Emil Lang was flying airliners for Germany's national airline when Germany invaded Poland, but it would not be until 1942 that he would trade his lumbering transport planes for the cockpit of a high-performance FW-190A. At 34, he was almost elderly by fighter pilot standards, but in a very short time, he would prove his skill in the air. His number of victories skyrocketed, and in October of 1943 alone, he shot down 68 Soviet fighters, a number he achieved by shooting down 10 planes on three separate days. However, it would be in the following month that he would make history. On November 3rd, 1943, he was leading a morning patrol near Kiev in Ukraine. The tempo of combat had remained high, and just the day before, he had added another eight aircraft to his tally. At 9.31 AM, he spotted a formation of IL-2 ground attack aircraft escorted by Yak-7 fighters. In under two minutes, four IL-2s and three Yaks had fallen to his guns. Rearming and refueling, he took off again around midday, and at 1 PM, he downed an LA-5 fighter followed by another Soviet plane not long after. Having already surpassed his previous day's score, it was during his fourth mission of the day that he would forge his name into history. Beginning at 2.16 PM, he engaged in frequent combat with the Soviet fighter forces, claiming a further two LA-5s, two Yak-9s, and five IL-2 attack planes. Returning to his airfield, Lang is reported to have thrust his hand in the air with joy, for he knew he had beaten the previous record of 17 kills in one day. He had just taken down 18 planes in the same time period. It was a score that would never be beaten. 10 months later, the life of this ace would come to an end when his plane was shot down during an engagement with American P-51 Mustangs. 
Those who were with him that day have said that his aircraft was suffering from mechanical problems as they rose to meet the Americans, but the supremely confident Lang pressed on. There is no denying that air power helped tip the balance in the European theatre of operations, but arguably it was even more instrumental in defeating Japan after the attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. Air power completely changed the nature of naval warfare, and as the US Navy clashed with the Imperial Japanese Navy at the Battle of the Coral Sea, it was the first time in history two naval fleets fought without the ship's crews ever seeing one another. Aircraft and aircraft carriers became the most important assets to a fleet commander, with almost all other types adopting a supporting role for them. In the opening rounds in the War of the Pacific, the Japanese Mitsubishi A6M Zero was king of the skies. It was extraordinarily nimble and fast compared to the heavier American and British planes, but this came at the expense of firepower and armoured protection. Eventually, Allied warplanes became more powerful to match the Zero's agility while maintaining their heavy firepower and protection, and coupled with growing Allied combat experience and subsequent changes of tactics, they soon began to turn the tide against the Zero. Even worse for the Japanese, the American manufacturing base far outstrips Japan's and was able to produce huge numbers of aircraft to overwhelm them with. Japan desperately needed pilots, and so their training program was scaled back to get new pilots into the fight as quickly as possible. Facing the well-trained and well-equipped US Navy, these poorly trained pilots stood little chance, and this was dramatically demonstrated during the Battle of the Philippine Sea between June 19th and June 20th, 1944. A massive American flotilla, numbering over 500 ships, had sailed to meet the Japanese in the Marianas Island chain on June 15th, 1944. Amongst this force were seven fleet carriers and eight light carriers, which possessed a collective air complement of over 900 aircraft. The Japanese, on the other hand, only possessed five fleet carriers and four light carriers, and even with support from land-based planes, could only muster approximately 750 aircraft. During the first day, the Japanese sent out four consecutive waves of aircraft to attack the American fleet. The Americans responded with large numbers of their F-6F Hellcat fighters, a warplane that was developed specifically to fight the Japanese Zeros. Flying off the fleet carrier USS Lexington, Lieutenant Alexander Vrasiu, who at the time was already one of the US Navy's highest scorers with 12 victories to his credit, spotted a formation of Japanese Judy dive bombers. Despite suffering with a malfunctioning supercharger, Vrasiu dived into the enemy formation and shot down six of them in under eight minutes, expending only 360 rounds of ammunition. After landing back on board the Lexington, Verasiu spotted Admiral Mitcher looking down at him, so he raised his hands up to him and held up six fingers. A photograph claiming to show this moment was actually staged after the fact for publicity purposes. On the second day of the battle, Verasiu shot down his 19th enemy plane, putting him out ahead as the US Navy's highest scoring ace, a title he would hold for four months. During the course of the battle, the Japanese lost as many as 650 aircraft at the cost of 123 American planes. It was a staggeringly one-sided fight and was dubbed by one US soldier as the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot. The Japanese carrier force was so decimated that there were barely enough planes left to fill the deck of just one of their fleet carriers. They would never recover and on all fronts, Allied air power owned the skies by the end of 1944. However, neither the Luftwaffe nor the Japanese Air Force were ever completely destroyed. Japanese fighters even tangled with American reconnaissance aircraft after the country surrendered, the final living testaments to the courage and bravery of all men who stepped into the cockpit and fought and died in the battles of the sky. And there you have the deadliest and most notable fighter pilots of World War II. Please leave a comment with your own thoughts down below, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.